ready? Amen. Amen. Let's start with a word of prayer. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we welcome you into this place. Thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. Lord, your protection is here with us, Lord. You dwell in the midst of us, Lord Jesus. We invite you, Lord Jesus, to, to speak to us, Lord. Through your utterance, through me, Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord, that lives will be changed, Lord. We get a clearer understanding of who you are, what we have, the redemption that we have, the protection that we have, the fullness of your love towards us will be revealed in greater measure, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we listen carefully, Lord. I pray, Lord, you open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Let us see pictures of you and let us be enlightened to know of the wonderful light that shines upon us in this time of great darkness, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Truly, this is a time of uh, great darkness, you know, not in the church, but in the world, all right? You, you, you look on the news, um, re most recently you would see coronavirus or tragedies going on, um, lots of disasters, and you shouldn't be surprised about these things because if you are of the spirit or you've been um, understanding the time and season that we're in, this is truly the last days. Uh, it shouldn't surprise you that these things are occurring. In fact, you can almost go on to say it should excite you, not in a sadistic way. Where, <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I haven't made my point yet. <laughs> not in a sadistic way that ha, 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 people are suffering. But it's more of a, it's a fulfillment of a prophecy where it says there will be deep darkness in the world. Amen? But arise, shine, for the glory of the Lord shines upon you. So in this period of deep darkness, there will be God's shining glory upon you. And as I said before, in a period of darkness, shining a light really shines brightest, right? If a light was shone right now, you probably can't really see too much. But if this place was in total darkness, then it would be very vivid. And then people would see, they would see the glory, the light, the prosperity, the favor upon you, the healing, the health, the provision all on you, and they will have no choice but to give glory to our Lord Jesus. Because that's why we are marked out, we are sealed with His Spirit, and therefore we, 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 we are off the world, we're in this world, but our citizenship is in heaven, amen. amen. Our position is really in the Holy of Holies, where we are protected, you know, by the wings of the cherubim, you know, who are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And in that secret place of the Most High, no evil, no terror, no arrow, no plague can ever come near you, all right? And that's what we'll be going on into today as well. But truly today, you know, it, um, it makes me think of uh, a testimony that our brother Jonathan Federici uh, shared with me many years ago. I don't know whether he remembers. He probably will remember this because it's a fact about his life. He was saying a few years ago, he, he, his, his, uh, his business is in machinery, right? So he said a few years ago, the industry was not doing too well uh, where he's at, North Queensland. And he said companies were suffering, it was a downturn, maybe companies were even shutting down or their orders were getting lower and lower. And, and he was noticing that in, in his uh, place, in his industry. Um, but what happened for him? was that in that year of famine, he started to see more and more orders, business coming his way. In the year of drought, in the year of famine, in the year where there's a downturn, the glory of the Lord was shining on him because he is walking in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus. Amen. I know him very well. Well, don't, maybe not as well as maybe I should, but you know, I have a clear understanding of his heart, his spirit, and I know... His, his, his eyes are always on the Lord. And when his eyes are beholding the Lord, he's following, he's walking in the footsteps of the abundance, you know. And that is many years ago. This, and this is what we should be expecting. That's why I say we should be excited. You know, while the things outside are bleak, are dark, are sick, we will actually go from glory to glory, shine brighter and brighter. You're getting healthier and healthier. Your marriage is getting stronger and stronger. 
you, you, and you, when you do your gym, <laughs> your husband can't help but join you. Amen. I don't know who's leading who there, but you know, I always, I'm very, uh, I'm a follower of your exercise videos. Uh, not that I do it though. <laughs> but that is the, the, the true fact. And we are singing today because of your love. Every time, the beauty of the new covenant, the beauty of Jesus is that the pressure is lifted off us. It is all about His love towards us. We sang the song, it's even shown in the lyrics, it says, Jesus, I love you. But how do we come to that, that, that part of the song? You offered your all for me because of your love. Therefore, Jesus, I love you. It's always about first a rece receiving of His love towards us first and then a natural response, an unconscious response. It's a can't help. You don't even need to conjure up you know, this kind. It's just a natural, I can't help but celebrate and sing of His love for me. I'm fearing and trembling at all the prosperity for me. The rain is going to be pouring down upon my land and it will be green, totally pastures, green pastures when there are wilderness out there. This is Isaiah 65 verse 11. Amen. We look at John, all right, chapter 19, verse, John chapter 21, verse 19. Amen. Can you guys still hear me? I can't really hear myself. <laughs> but you see, um, you probably have heard this before. You, you know that John is the disciple that describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loves. You know, and you only find this in the book of John, all right? And who wrote the book of John? John, all right? So he's saying, and the disciple that Jesus loved, all right? We read this here. This he spoke. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus speaking to Peter, all right? This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So I'll show you four verses here, 19 to 22. And Jesus, in these four verses, had to tell Peter to follow him twice. Amen? So that shows that Peter really had a difficulty following. All right? If you needed to be told twice in a matter of four verses, it means that you know, there's something that our Lord Jesus really wanted to emphasize to him. Amen? Next verse, 20. Then Peter, turning around, he turns, let's say that's John, he turns and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, amen, who had also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So he's always, see, see what I'm trying to say here. This is what the Lord was showing me throughout the week. He's saying, Peter had trouble following the Lord because his eyes was always on what he could do. It was always on the circumstances. That's why you talk about him walking on water. He was able to follow initially, but then he looked at the surrounding and he began to sink. Or he would say, even if all these people, the rest of the disciples deny you, I will not deny you. He's always looking at his flesh. And therefore, he had great difficulty following, actually. That's why Jesus had to say, you follow me, verse 19, verse 22, you follow me, all right? But here we have the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, he was following right there. Do you see that there? Jesus didn't have to tell him that. He followed. And what is, why am I emphasizing this point? He can only follow because he had a great revelation of Jesus' love for him. All right, Because he was conscious of that. He wrote that all the time in the Bible, the disciple that Jesus loved, the, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved, and he constantly always followed. It was easy for him to follow, all right? Two chapters before that, when Jesus was on the cross, you see that the only disciple that came to the cross, the only one that didn't forsake was, Je was John, right? And then when Jesus was on the cross, he said to John, John, your mother Mary, Mary, your son John. All right, I know you're married, but maybe, maybe I should use some, another example. And then what was John's response? That very hour, he took Mary into his own home, meaning he obeyed the instruction very quickly. Right? So when you're following 
the Lord Jesus, when you have a revelation is about His love for you, it's easy to follow. It's unconscious and you, you, you don't need to be told. And the best thing about it is you're following somebody who's ironclad, guaranteed, going to bless you. Your paths shall drip with abundance, right? I was talking about that. You follow, when you follow Jesus, you can't help but walk into the abundance that He has already deliberately dropped for you. So, you've, so therefore, it's very important for us to always be meditating on His love for us, never about our love for Him, right? Our love for Him is at a totally different level. His love from us, for us far exceeds. It's far more supernatural. Amen? That's why John goes on to say in the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verse 10 to 11. Let's read that, all right? In this is love, not that we loved God. All right? So he defines it very clearly. It's not about you loving God. It's about He loving us. And how did He love us? By sending His Son to be the propitiation, the mercy seat, the, the atoning cover, the one that diverted the wrath, all right, for us. That is the definition of love. So when you hear and read the verses where it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your spirit, recalibrate your mind. What is the kind of love that is being described there? It's not your love for God. The writer, Jesus, is basically saying, with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your spirit, incorporate this, that it is the love of God for you and not your love of God. That is true love, right? And then verse 11, it says, therefore, if God loves, if God has loved us this way, we ought to love one another. But take the burden off yourself. It's basically here, how am I loving you today? I'm telling you that it's not about your love for God that really matters. It's about His love for you. That's my way of loving you. Amen? I tell you, if you do that with your spouse, can you imagine how great that's going to be? Imagine if you went to your spouse and say, and I said to my wife, Daisy, oh, I, would, I don't call her Daisy, I call her, I mean, I don't give the nickname right now, or it's, you're going to start teasing me, all right? Daisy, <laughs> it's not about what you do. It's nothing about what you do for me. It's about my love for you. Don't feel obligated to do anything. I tell you what, you will see new wine <laughs> in your marriage, I'm sure. Amen? And Eva can say amen. <laughs> and all the wives can say amen to that. It's always this concept of receiving first. That's why I keep, I don't want to use the word nagging, but I keep saying this to you guys. Receive first, receive first, receive first, receive first. Because when you are in that posture of receiving, then out of the overflow, you can give. And it becomes natural. It doesn't consume your energy. Why do I say that? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Let's read this, all right? Blessed be the... This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort. So Paul, this is verse 3, very early on in his letter, he really points the Corinthian church to say, look at the God of comfort. Amen? And what does the God of comfort do? Verse 4, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Stop. With your own natural talent, with your own um, uh, qualifications at university, with your own uh, personality traits, with your own strength? No. How do you comfort? With the comfort by which we ourselves are comforted by God. Amen. So what this actually means is we really receive and we just hand out. All right? If, if you gave me $50 and I gave $50 there, nothing comes out of my bank account. It's just coming straight from the giver. And therefore, I'm not shortchanged. Amen. But this is the way, when I saw this, I was so happy, you know, because it's really um, reiterating what our position is in the new covenant. Receive first, and with that comfort, give. This week has been a trying week for me, frankly speaking, all right? I needed to be comforted by God. Even as late as this morning, you know, I, I just felt the presence of God 
um, speaking to me and just saying, oh, Joey, or the Spirit just whispering in my heart, I'm so pleased with you. I'm so pleased with you. And that is, that I'm, I'm not boasting of how pleasing I am. I'm boasting of God's love towards me. And that same love that He has to me, He has to all of us. Right? But it's a, it was a comfort to me, an encouragement to me. You know? And then with that now, I can stand here and with that comfort that I first received, pass it on to you guys. Not through my own comforting. Not through my own... I'm, I'm a psychologist by training. I'm not using any psychology here. All right? That's the wisdom of the world. It's natural. But when it comes to the house of God, the church of God, the presence of Jesus, the supernatural, miracle, working power of Jesus is more abundant and supernatural than your earthly efforts. Earthly efforts you're subject to, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But with Jesus, it's all good. Amen? So say to yourself, I am the one who Jesus loved. I am the one who He cares for. Amen? And therefore, it makes it very easy for you to follow. All right? I'll give you an example. Last week, um, my wife Daisy, who, uh, you know, just a bit of context to this, uh, me and my wife Daisy, we always talk about household chores, administration of family matters, um, children, taking care of children, etc. I'm sure all who are married with children can understand that, all right? And I have always um, had a nagging spirit, all right? I'll be the first to admit that. So I'll, I'll, I like to, you know, gently encourage my wife to do more um, around the house. And she does fantastic, all right? I think the problem is more with me rather than with her, all right, in this area. But sometimes the flesh is weak, amen? So I keep saying, do this, do that, blah, 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 whatever, you know? Quite annoying, I would say. Um, but... Last week, a very strange phenomena happened in my household, right? Very, very unusual. Daisy, my wife, started doing a lot of housework, all right? A lot more than usual. She really does a fantastic amount, but she started doing more. She started putting the vacuum, started preparing the food, like, like in sequence, no break at all. Just tum, 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 tum. It's like, wow, this is... It's like a, a machine here. She's just, she's just really knocking it all down. And, uh, and I thought in my heart, ah, see? Thank goodness you were nagging so much. It's finally born fruit. <laughs> the penny has dropped finally, all right? But that's obviously not true because the Lord corrected me and He showed me. He showed me some wisdom. He said, you know why she is this way? Think about what you just did a few hours ago, all right? So a few hours ago, I came to her with a list on my piece of paper. I said, here you go. These are a list of, not errands to do, these are a list of mobile phones that you can choose to buy. <laughs> because she had told me, her mobile phone had run out of memory. She loves to take a lot of photos, you know, and videos. And she, using an iPhone, it doesn't have enough space, blah, 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 all right? Um, and then I went to do some research. Not a lot, trust me, just maybe five minutes. But I just went to the website and said, based on my plan, blah, 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 this, this is the, these are the types of phone that you can buy, all right? And then she was saying, which one? I said, you choose any one. Very generous, right? Amen. But at that point, I was convicted of the generosity of God towards me first. And therefore, I was able to give. I was able to comfort with what I first received first. All right? And then, that's what God was showing me. Why can she follow? Why was she doing these things so unconsciously, so naturally? Why? Because she knew that she was loved. Simple as that. Because she saw my heart, because I had listened to her request. Just clarify, she's not a materialistic person. In the end, she didn't choose the most expensive or latest model. She just got something that had the most memory, all right, um, and did the job. But what I'm trying to say is she heard and she felt that I loved her and cared for her. And then naturally, she just started doing all the things, you know, uh, vacuum. She had a mask on, can you imagine, while cleaning out the vacuum cleaner. 
She doesn't have coronavirus, by the way, but she had a mask on to just protect herself from the dust. All right, that's how conscientious she was. But the Lord was showing me, it's not because of your nagging, it's not about your instruction, it's simply about your love for her, which helps her follow, all right? And it's always about that. Uh, it, psychologically speaking, and this is where my training, my earthly training as a psychologist, you know, I can tell you about some very, very um, harmful psychologi psychological conditions that come when this whole concept of love is reversed, all right? We should be receiving love from our parents, the nurturing, the support, the comfort, the physical provision all the time. However, unfortunately, in, through various circumstances in life, let's say the parent is physically unable or emotionally unable, the roles are reversed. This is what we call a parentified child, meaning the child assumes the role of the parent, all right? And rather than the, the, the parent cooking and preparing and sending them off to school, the child from a very young age, like seven, eight, nine, has to learn how to cook, has to learn how to be independent, or in a worst case scenario, has to learn how to comfort the parent, you know? They do learn good skills, like independence, cooking, going to school on their own, being sensitive, empathic, but research will tell you when they hit early adulthood, that is when they start to develop very severe psychological issues. They have become very prone to depression and anxiety because there's an innate need in them that has never been met. We are all born with this need to be loved first, to receive first. But if that is not filled, we then, and it becomes actually opposite. It's very unhealthy, very bad for your mental health. So therefore, the solution I will be doing you a disservice here if I'm, I'm just preaching all about you need to do this for God, you need to do that for God. I'm putting you into depression, basically. I'm putting you into, in, into, into works, into the law, and you will not inherit the true goodness. Amen? It is all about dependent on Him giving to you first, Him buying you out, Him redeeming you, Him going to the cross for you, and you just in that posture of receiving receiving. Amen? Everybody understand that so far? Everybody in agreement with me? That's why your husband, Toa, was saying, oh, it's about his forgiveness, all he's done for me. No point in his prayer was, thank you, Lord, for all that I've done for you. Thank you, Lord, that, you know, I went to church last week and, and I took communion three times a day. It, you know, it's not about that. He had the revelation. Or his eyes were open. Oh, Jesus, this is how much you care for me is how much you care for me. So, when you know how much you are loved, it's easy to follow. Amen? And that brings me to what I want to talk about today. <laughs> or shall we close in prayer? <laughs> see, see how the Spirit leads us, amen? Um, I just have to follow myself. I have to stand here and just be conscious of His love for me. Amen? Uh, suffice to say that is the only thing that really sustains uh, anybody ministering amen but it brings me to this story of Boaz and Ruth that I want to go through today I probably can't go through everything but Boaz and Ruth is a beautiful story and two weeks ago when I talked about Caleb uh, how many of you remember what I was saying about K Caleb Caleb has a following spirit amen and a following spirit as we see in Numbers chapter 14 verse 24. This is how God describes Caleb. In my servant Caleb is a different spirit or a following spirit. And the root word for that is he remains behind. Aka, acha, de delay, hesitate, remain behind, procrastinate. Basically, he lets somebody go ahead first and then he waits. It's a picture of somebody not working in the flesh. All right? Somebody is happy to keep the word of God within him, follow the direction, follow the leading, follow the gift that has already been given to them. Amen. And we see in the story of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 7, we see Ruth with that same word described there. And in, in four places, in fact, if you read the story of Ruth, you see 
She follows, she follows, she follows, she follows. Chapter 1, she follows her mother-in-law, Naomi. Chapter 2, she says, I will glean after the reapers. Means I will follow whatever they are getting, the barley, the wheat, whatever drops, I just pick up. I let them go ahead first. I don't go ahead and try and do their job. You know, I let them do the work for me, basically. And I just pick up, you know. And she's described as having a following spirit, amen. And this is, this is what I'm talking about. The following spirit, the waiting, you know, allows us to receive bread, amen. Because when we follow, the grains drop on our road, all right. He is baking bread for us. He desires to break, bake bread for us. Jesus says He is the bread of life. You know, His sustenance comes when He's able to give, to feed, all right? He's always saying, you give them something to eat. When He resurrected the, 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 the little girl, after she came to life, He said, now give her something to eat. So His heart is always to give spiritual food, but also physical food. He is the bread of life. That's why it says, your fa- forefathers in the wilderness ate manna, yet they died. But He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me shall not perish. Right? The manna is not the true bread. He says he is the true bread. Right? And it comes when you have this following, following spirit, a waiting spirit. Just wait for him to drop the bread for you and pick it up and receive. Bread speaks of prosperity, growth, being strong. Amen? And overcoming challenges. Numbers chapter 14, verse 9 you see what Caleb says. He says, Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Amen? So the challenges, the giants in the land are actually become bread for them. Whatever challenges that you're facing, whether it's shame, lack, uh, health issues, see Jesus, the Lord Jesus melted on the cross for you, baked for you, the burnt offering, and see Him making bread for you, and these challenges become bread for you, all right? And so that is, that's, that's just the beauty of having this following spirit because bread is given to you and given in abundance, all right? I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but it's a very... Uh, <laughs> this is what you would see. There are a lot of similarities in the story of Caleb and the story of Ruth. As I said, the first similarity is they have a following spirit. Did you show them Ruth 2, 7? Was it up there? She has a following spirit. Also, you would see, if we go back to 14 verse 9 numbers, you would see C- Caleb says, their protection has departed from them. The Lord is with us, therefore we do not fear. So not only is there bread available for Caleb and Ruth, there's also protection, all right? That's, and, and I'll show you today... Um, how that really plays out in this story. Amen. So let's get straight into it Um, while everybody still has stamina, right? (laughs) Ruth, all right? Let's see. The story of Ruth is set, firstly set in Bethlehem, all right? Now, what's the meaning of Bethlehem? Amen. So happy you guys know that. Beth, house, Lechem, bread. So his base was first originated in Bethlehem. And uh, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, and her husband, Elimelech, they were in Bethlehem, and they were in the time of famine. There was no bread for them. What did they do? They left, and they went to the city, the place, the country of Moab, all right? And that's where they, their sons, Malon and Chilon, met Ruth and Opa and married uh, Ruth and Orpah, all right? Two sons married the two girls there, the two or more biters, right? So understand this, Ruth was a Moabite. She wasn't a Jewish girl, all right? Um, and that's found in Ruth chapter 1, verse 5. Let's read together, Ruth chapter 1, verse 5. Then both Malon and Chilon died. So the woman survived and her two sons and husband. Verse 6. Then she, meaning Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. So it's always when the Lord comes, he comes to give bread. 
He comes to heal the land of the famine, all right? I'll give you a bit of history about Moab, all right? Because it, 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 you will see that Ruth, in the end, she disinherits herself from being a Moabite. She says, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Speaking to her mother-in-law, Naomi, who was a Jewish from Bethlehem originally. So she's saying, she, I disinherit my Moabite uh, lineage or what we represent and I adopt a new thing. It's a picture of us really, disinheriting you know, what we once were and what we are now, um, which we're all in the house of bread, amen? Uh, because that's where Jesus was born. Right, but a bit of an, a, a history into Moabites. The Moabites come from the land of Moab. All right, sounds quite straightforward. Moab is the son of Lot. All right, so he's a descendant of Lot. So to understand the people of the the Moab people and what they represent, we need to understand what where Lot and basically what are the the, the defining things about Lot. All right. Genesis chapter 13, verse 10 to 11 gives us a clue, gives us an idea into the lineage of the Moabite people and something that we now are not in. Because Ruth is a picture of us, the church, and Boaz being our heavenly Jesus, all right? The story is Abraham and Lot needed to separate, all right? And this is what Lot decided to do. Lot lifted his eyes. Say, lifted his eyes. What does that mean? He Look by his sight, his natural sight. They, they had the whole land before them. And so between Lot and Abraham, they were deciding where to go, who to take which land. Lot lifted his eyes and saw the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered. Amen? Why? Because it was right beside the river Jordan. It was fertile, all right? When there's a river there, it's fertile. Well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zohar. Verse 11, Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separate right there, separated right there. So a Moabite person is somebody that goes by sight. All right? That says, I look at what is good in the natural, and I go there. But what is a person, what is our position in the New Covenant now? What did she change towards? Right? That's where we get Ruth chapter 1 verse 5, 6, sorry, and we can read what actually happens. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab for she had heard. All right? See the difference there. The Moabite lineage is going by sight. That's a very good land there. Right? But she heard that the Lord of Israel the Lord of Bethlehem at that point, had visited. And the word there, visited, means taken care of, attended to, looked after. So it was a very caring God. All right? And so that is our position right now. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. So when we sit here or in our private time at home, hear the love of Christ from us, we actually transition from moving by sight to going by faith. And when we're in that position of faith, you know what happens? Chapter 2 happens. All right? And let's go into chapter 2. Verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth. In the King James, it says, mighty and rich. Mighty meaning he had a lot of bread, right? very strong and rich. Of the family of Elimelech, his name was Boaz. All right? So everything in the, new, in the old, cover, old Testament is hidden pictures of Jesus. You might have heard Pastor Prince say that, and I'm sure all of us are students of that. We want to see more and more of Jesus, right? Boaz represents our Lord Jesus, amen? And he was a very rich man. He was full of bread, amen? Verse 2, And Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, whose sight I shall find grace. And she said, Go, my daughter. Amen? So she, she had this confidence. Why does she have this confidence? She, firstly, she had heard that the land of Israel, the land of Bethlehem was very, was starting to be taken care of by the Lord again. And then 
she, she heard that this man, Boaz, was starting to be prosperous. The Lord was with him. Amen. And so she had this faith that a very caring God, a very loving and, and, and visiting God who would attend to the needs of his people was richly, fully with this man, Boaz. And so she had this, she heard about that, her faith arose, and she said, now I'll go there and I will find grace in his sight. Amen. That's really the position of us. We disinherit by, she had heard, all right? She, she didn't see Boaz yet. She just said, I will go and find favor. And it says, this all occurs then of them coming back to Bethlehem, the house of bread. Amen. Boaz, the picture of our Lord Jesus, was born in Bethlehem. Our Lord Jesus born in Bethlehem, house of bread. Where was he born? All right? In a manger. All right? And if you look at the word manger, it means feeding trough. Right? Many of you know that. So already, right from the start, our Lord Jesus was designed to be the bread of life. He was there to be fed on. He was already prepared to be baked and then produce bread. His inward parts would be melted away by heat and cause the bread to drop for you. That was always the plan. You know, Luke chapter 2 verse 12, you know, you would see that this is when the angels appeared to the shepherds and, he, and they said to them, this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths. All right? So they, they said, look for this sign. Now, think about it. Is there anything unusual about a baby having swaddling cloths? How many of you have babies or had babies before? When they are first born, what do you do? Leave them unswaddled? No, you swaddle them. And it says, while shepherds watch their flock by night. So this is nighttime, it was probably cold. So there's nothing unusual. That wasn't the sign. The true sign is that he is lying in a manger. It's a true sign to the world that he is there to be the bread of life. He's there to give you bread, to change your, 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 your challenges, your circumstances, your fears into bread, to sustain you and to grow strong for you. And at that very moment, as it says in verse 13, suddenly a big roar of hosts, angels started singing, verse 14, praising God, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good word, goodwill towards all men. What was their cue to start singing? What made them can't help but start singing? when he was described as being food for you, when he was lying in a manger. At that point, it changes to the, to the, the chorus of angels that's going on. Amen? But we go into the story here of Boaz and Ruth. In chapter 2, she had a following spirit. She disinherited her walking by sight. And now she goes into just following, all right? We pick up the story maybe in verse 7, all right? She said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaf. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested little in the house. Now, this is where Boaz started um, noticing her. He says, verse 8, then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, will you not? So very quickly he says, listen, listen to my word, all right? Um, don't go by sight anymore. Listen. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Do not go to glean in another field. Stay, in, stay with me. Stay with Jesus. All right? in, in, when you come back to the house of bread, don't get fed by anything else but the Lord Jesus. Amen. Don't go into weird teachings that put, put, put the onus on you that you are actually the one baking the bread. No, you're the one eating the bread. Amen. Uh, make a distinction. All right? No, go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap. Go after them. Here's another after. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? Protection for her. All right? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. She doesn't need to draw the water. It's drawn from her. All right? This is the, uh, the, the loving nature of Jesus. All right? When you come back to him, when you feed you know, on, on, on His provision for you, it becomes, I will do this for you. I will I'll ensure your safety. I will think ahead for you. Amen. That's why you know, it, we've been listening to Pastor Prince step by step. Amen. In the early parts of his year, he's been talking about that. 
step by step here, Ruth just came back. But when she took the first step to go back there, the help, the instruction actually comes from Boaz. He says, this is what I will, I see ahead for you. I will protect you. I will, I will give unto you. Amen. Verse 12. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given to you for the Lord, God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. All right? Take note of this word wings because this is going to be um, where we get the protection thing from. First, we have the bread, but we also have protection. Under whose wings you have come for refuge. That's why I say protection. Verse 14. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread. See here he says, even though you just picked up there, I will make bread for you. There's another scenario here where he is, his heart is always wanting to give. I will eat the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. Now, um, previously I talked about sour wine, all right? Uh, this is not a, a case of making her take a piece of bread and eating and it's ugh, so sour and, and vomiting, you know? It's not that because they were all eating that. If you do a little bit of research, you know, vinegar uh, actually refreshes, you know, the meal. It makes it more uh, enticing, particularly after a hot day, you know, uh, when, when you, when in, those, in, that, in those days, the culture. So it's the heart to refresh, amen, her. So she sat beside the reapers and he, Boaz, passed parched, grain to her. Parched grain or roasted grain. Burnt grain. And if you look at the dictionary, it means when you burn something, you dry something out and it shrinks and it becomes like dried food for you. Whether it's bread, dried fruit or whatever it is, it's a picture there of what is always served to you by our Lord Jesus. His own body burnt for you, dried up for you, for your sustenance, for your life, for your strength. Amen? Roasted grain. It makes you think of fat ashes, right, when I talk about that, the burnt offering, how Jesus was the burnt offering for us. Now, this is something that I really want to highlight. The, end, the last part of verse 14. And she ate and was satisfied. Amen? That means she ate it was nice, eat, nice to eat. It was also uh, satisfying. Means she had enough. All right. Why did she ha have enough? Because she kept some back. All right. Or maybe she was. This is not some uh, Weight Watchers program or something like that. She really ate to a point where she was happy, and then she kept some back. Now, remember early on I said, God gives us the comfort first, then we can comfort others. This is something that we can see right here with what's going on, all right? We skip a little bit down to verse 17, all right? It says, she continued gleaning and she beat out what she had gleaned and it became an ephah of barley. Then she went back home. Then she went into the city where her mother-in-law was. She brought back and gave to her. Now, what did she give her? Did she give to her what she had beat out and gleaned from? No, she gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. She received the overflow and she gave. She kept whatever she had worked for. In fact, the Bible doesn't really talk too much about what she did with that. It's not important, I believe. The, the main point is, out of the overflow that she received, she then gave and she comforted. Comforted her her mother-in-law, who was at that point saying, I'm, I've been afflicted. My life is so bitter. I've lost my husband. I've lost my two sons. There's nobody here to redeem me anymore. All right? Why do I say she has been comforted? Verse 13, this is what uh, Ruth was saying. Let me find favor in your sight, for you have comforted me. So she had first received the comfort, the provision. Later on in the story, it goes on to say, look, Boaz says, deliberately drop grain for her. Let it make, it make it even more abundant for her. Let her have a lot. That was, that, that was his heart for her. 
And all she needed to do was keep the word of God that she had heard, keep the word of Boaz, which is just follow, just follow. Let them do their thing. Let them do the hard work. I just pick up. I just pick up and take what I need. That is our position. What, what, what a wonderful position that we have. Amen. And on top of that, he cooked us lunch as well. And he made us sit right beside us. You know, it's, a, it's the heart of God that really wants to, to bless you. It's always about him giving unto you first. Look at this in this story. What does Ruth, what, what, what did Ruth ever do for him? Not a lot. In fact, you know, Boaz says to Ruth, may God reward you for all that you have done. All right? But really what has she done? The only thing she's done is followed Naomi to, to back to Bethlehem. That's the only thing she's done. And then maybe said, I will find grace in, this, in, in whoever's... That's, she hasn't done anything much. She's just had this following. And therefore, this is what Jesus says to you, may the Lord reward you. May the Lord give you the full reward. All right? So she worked on her own. She had one ephah of barley. All right? Later on, you would actually see that Boaz gave her six ephahs. Ephahs, what am I saying? Measures of barley, okay? One, six. What's six? Minus one, five. All right? Whatever she had worked for compared to what Boaz wanted to give, Boaz's giving was five times more, plus five, more than what she could ever produce. Amen? Uh, you, you see that in the book of, in the chapter number three. Amen? How are we all going? I want to close with this, something very uh, important. Um, Ruth chapter three, verse eight to nine. All right? And I think this is, this is very apt, very suitable for this timing that we have right now in this world. I'm sure when you read about the difficult challenges out there in the world, your heart may be a little bit scared, a little bit uh, worried, all right? This is what happened after the barley harvest, after everything. You know, I don't have time to go through the whole story, but we just see in, in verse 8, this is what Ruth then did going towards Boaz. Verse 8, now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself and there a woman was lying at his feet. Amen. How many of you would be very surprised? How many men would be, whoa, what's going on here? Why are you lying at my feet? You know, or do you have the guts to be near my feet knowing how they smell? You know, but no, this is what happened there. And he said, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your maid servant. Take your maid servant." under your wing for you are a close relative all right so what was going on there she was lying at the feet of boaz a picture of our lord jesus and it says take your maid servant under your wing literally what that means spread the corner of your garment over your maid servant all right i said that again when she says take your maid servant under your wing it literally is written there, if you look at the translation, spread the corner of your garment over me. That is a picture of, in those days, when somebody does that, he says, I will protect this person. This person is mine. All right? This person belongs to me. I will redeem this person. All right? But what I want to focus right there is this word, wing. All right? Um, do I have the word there? Wing, the edge, the corner of the garment. All right. Psalms 91 verse 1 uh, is, a very, is a verse that has been used quite a lot, especially in this time of, you know, pestilence, coronavirus, whatever virus. Amen. Let's read Psalms 91 verse 1. He who dwells, dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. And maybe some of you are already connecting some of the dots here, and I'm very happy to see that. Um, the word shadow there is cell, T S E L. Um, it, is, it is 
is called the secret place of the Most High. All right? And this is where I believe it is talking about the position underneath the cherubim, all right? the secret place of the Most High. You know, show them a picture of the Ark of the Covenant, if you could. All right, this is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. All right? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. All right? So in those days, what, how it would often appear is that when God came down to meet with His people, He would sit, He says this is His throne, literally. He would come down, He sits on the wings of the cherubim. The bottom part, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat, right? Which Jesus is for us, right? And it says as we dwell in there, what actually happens? We are actually under the shadow of the Almighty. The corner, the garment, the wing of our, of our Lord is actually over us a picture of redemption and protection. Therefore, no evil, no arrow, no terror, no plague can ever come near you when you're abiding in this position. Why? Because you can only be in this position when you're in Christ. The lid of the mercy seat is Jesus and that's where you sprinkle the blood. So the devil and all his legions and enemies and sickness do not have the blood. So therefore, they cannot come near this place. But this is a place that you and I are now in when we're in the new covenant. We are under the cover, the skirt of His garment. All right? Psalm 61 verse 4. This is Psalms written by David. All right? And David's concept, his idea of the tabernacle has only one piece of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant. All right? So he must know, this is what he's describing, I will abide in, the, in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter, the covering of your wings. This word wings, same word for what Boaz's garment was, kanaf, the edge, the extremity, the skirt, the corner of the garment was covering them. He says, I will abide there, salah, rest. Psalms 27 verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his tabernacle, pavilion, in the secret place, all right, of his tabernacle, he shall hide me, all right. So this is when we are, when we, Christ has become the mercy seat for us, amen. When we're in his protection, when we come to the feet of Jesus, just like when Ruth came to the feet of Boaz, his garment was over her, signifying that this is my, my property, someone that I will protect, someone that I will redeem. And if you look at the imagery, when we come to the throne of grace, through which we have access to our Lord Jesus, we are now underneath the wings of the cherubim. We are overshadowed with His protection. Amen? With His security. It's a secret place. It's a secret place and I love what, what it says in Ruth chapter um, 3, verse 14. You would see there, this is Boaz's instruction to his people. Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. He's saying, keep it a secret, right? This is her secret place right there. Verse 13, stay this night, right? Stay. I want to highlight this word, stay. It means dwell overnight, all right? That's what they're basically saying, stay this night. Psalms 91 verse 1, we go back to that. Sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. But Psalms 91 verse 1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. This word abide is the same word stay. The same word that it says stay the night. So if you stay the night and just sit still, all right, and let your heavenly Boaz go and resolve the matter for you like he was going to do, it's really a picture of, of resting, and remaining behind. Remember how I talk about Ruth having a following spirit, a different spirit, a remaining behind spirit? Basically then he, she allowed her redeemer, Boaz, to go and do the work for her, to do the redeeming work for her. That's why it says in Ruth chapter two, 3, verse 18, this is Naomi's instruction to Ruth. Sit still, my daughter, 
until you know that the, how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. That means when you're sitting in the shelter of the Most High, right, God is fighting your battle for you. He is the one that goes out there. He is the one that resolves it for you. He will not rest until he sees to it, until he gets it done. He will not rest until you see provision in your workplace. He will not rest until you see provision and blossoming of your marriage. He will not rest, you know, until all your needs are met. But the key thing there is just sitting and remaining in the secret place of the Most High. All right? Let me close with this. Uh, I, say, I said how Ruth and Caleb are very similar. We go back to Ruth, chap- sorry, <laughs> Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. Right? Only, this is Caleb saying, Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. That word protection is shadow. Their defense is shadow. Right? And so he's saying, these people who are not supposed to be in our land, their shadow has departed from them. Shadow meaning a picture of protection. Their defense is no longer with them. But because the Lord is with us, we have the shadow of protection on us. And therefore, we can possess this land. The Lord is with us. And therefore, Caleb, the secret to his health, was he kept the word of God in his heart and he always knew that he had the protection of the Lord. He had the provision of the Lord. Therefore, he didn't need to go out of rest. He could just rest and just follow the leading of his wonderful God and that led him into a place of great health, great strength. Not because he was a great warrior, but because he was able to just remain in this position. All right? Hebrews 9, chapter 5 we we'll read this as we close. I've said we we'll read this as we close quite a number of times, but I promise this may be the last one. All right? This is talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. This thing, the overshadowing, all right? See the, 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 the wings of the cherubim when you come to the, the, the Ark of the Covenant where we are hidden in Christ on the mercy seat. We, are, we have the overshadowing, the protection. Therefore, we are not affected by the things of the world. In fact, we can expect to be redeemed from those things. We can expect to have a greater measure where the world will delve deeper and deeper into lack, poverty, and etc. We go the other way. Just like, you know, what, what I talked about, Jonathan and his business going up while everybody goes down. Our health goes up. Why? Because we're dwelling in this secret place and see that it is Boaz who says, I will redeem you. How? I will spread the edge of my garment over you. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of when the woman with the issue of blood, she comes and she says, if I only can touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. She comes, she touches the, the hem of his garment, and his garment was probably lower, but I, I don't, I'm not wearing that today, <laughs> and I never will, but you know, um, she comes and touches. But this is what, what, what God was showing me. When, 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 Daniel, stand up, please. <laughs> C- come and touch my shirt, just my shirt. <laughs> hey, <laughs> okay. When she came and touched the hem of the garment, right, what, what is happening to her? The whole garment is overshadowing. All right, her. Huh. Thank you, bro. This, this, this is what, what actually happened right there. Uh, when she came and she reached for the Lord Jesus, you know, and she touched his righteousness, the blue tassel, which represents his perfect obedience. All right? When she touched it, his garment would be overflowing on her. And see the picture of, our Lord, uh, of God sitting on the cherubim. The Bible says the mercy seat is his footstool. All right? And he sits on the wings of the cherubim. We are underneath the wings. And so the garment of God is actually over us, overshadowing us in that position. It's a secret place that nobody, no, no evil can ever enter. Why? It is blood-bought. 
It is covenant. The life is in the blood. It is all there for us. All right? So be confident. Be assured that your health is going to get better. It's not going to get worse. Be confident that you will walk in paths of abundance. But just follow. I started off by saying, it's, e- it's easy to follow when you know that you're loved. Amen? Firstly, feel the heart of your heavenly Boaz for you that says, I will redeem you, and I don't mind redeeming you if it means I have to redeem all these people as well. All right? I will pay the price. Um, I will do it. I'm, I will not rest until I ensure that you come under my covering. Amen? That is our Lord Jesus, His heart for you. Just one look at Him and He wants to bake bread for you. Remember that Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 9? You have ravished my heart. This is, this is Solomon speaking to his bride, his beloved bride. Just one look at you and I want to bake bread. Just one look at you and I want to protect you, give you the victory. I want to encompass you under my robe of righteousness. I want to protect you. All you need to do is just follow Listen, keep the word of God in your heart. Look unto Him, not unto yourself. Rest in the secret place of the Most High. Abide and trust that, you know, this is such a wonderful, precious place. That is what I've been trying to be doing this week, you know, just reminding myself of, you know. And, and in that place, is not just protection. It's intimacy. It's, you know, he, he, you, can, you, you can meet with God face to face. And you can talk to him. You can talk to him about what's troubling you. You can talk to him about what is frustrating you. And there have been a lot of things that have been frustrating me this week. You can talk to him about what, what challenges you're facing. He meets you face to face. And he wants to resolve the problems for you. He wants to serve you bread. What a wonderful saviour. That's why your husband will be saying it's all about his sacrifice. And today I hope you have a, a, a greater understanding into the, your position. You know, sometimes pictures can help us see a little bit our position. We, are, we have gone through the veil. That's why we sang this morning. You tore the veil. You made a way. Made a way into where? Into the Holy of Holies. What is in the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant. Therefore, we have bonus to enter the throne of grace. And where are we in this throne, throne room? We are seated in Christ. And the Bible says, Christ has been made for us a propitiation, a mercy seat for us. So we are right there under the wings of the cherubim. And the overshadowing is upon us. And His protection is upon us. His safety, His intimacy. No evil. The world cannot touch that. It is sacred. It is so strong. It is supernatural. Amen? Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that it is about what you have done for us. We thank you, Lord, that we can dwell securely, safely in all that you have already accomplished for you. We thank you, Lord, that we are hidden in your secret place, hidden like a special treasure, hidden like something that is precious, not just hidden that some, like something that we want to not look at, but hidden as precious, valuable things in your sight. We thank you, Lord, that we have provision, bread for all our challenges. We thank you, Lord, that we have your, your supply, your intimacy, your care, Lord. No evil, I proclaim that upon each and every one of us this morning. No evil, no arrow, no terror, no plague shall ever come near you in the mighty name of Jesus that has already been done for you. Lord, we see us seated with you under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty, protected, supplied, safe. Lord, and we rest knowing that you are the one going to do the work for us. You are fighting our battles. You care for us, Lord. So I speak the blessing upon each and every one of you this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you safe under the, the shadow of His almighty wings. He keeps you safe from all areas. He keeps your business safe. He keeps your children safe. He keeps your relationships safe. 
He keeps your houses safe. Your dwellings will be safe. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you. May He be smiling at you. His glory shining over you. May you be a showpiece person that the world will see. Why is this person so favoured? Because the favour of the Lord is smiling down at you. The Lord bless you with His shalom peace. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.